there, nation, and welcome to the show where we help you to play miniatures wargaming on a budget. It is I, Commander Cheapskate, and we are back in the episode of Way of the Inner Hive. This series is dedicated to helping brand new players to Nicaragua build their starting rosters and learn more about the game mechanics of their favorite gangs. And on today's episode, we will discuss playing a Vansar gang in the Aranthian Succession. We will discuss the positive and negative aspects of playing the Aranthian Succession, as well as the impact the Aranthian Succession has had on Vansar gangs. We'll discuss online. Alliances, brutes, hangers on, as well as hired guns, provide a 2,400 starting roster that you could use in your very first campaign, detail how to play that gang on the tabletop with our tabletop tactics, and also talk about how you can develop the gang as the campaign continues. And of course, provide more critical information that could be useful in your campaigns. So with the latest uh, installment of the Aranthi Secession dropping, which is the Ruins of Jardland, the Vansar gangs have got a lot of love from that supplement with some new rules, new fighters, as well as some new units that they can now field on the tabletop. So the question that you need to ask yourself is, why would you want to play House Vansar? Do you like the idea of being a high-tech fighter in a low-tech world? Is shooting and having the most powerful, overpowered, long-range shooting weapons like an appeal to you? Do you want to enjoy the brand new rules that the Aranthian Session has brought to you? Well, then you're in luck because this gang have received a lot of it, and we're going to talk about that in this video. Now, because this video will be a little bit more of a deeper dive, I will put timestamps in the description box below so that way you can click and navigate to the part that interests you the most. So that being said, let's go and talk about the positive negatives of playing in the Aranthian Succession. So first of all, let's talk about the positives of playing in the Aranthian Succession. You have anywhere between 2,000 to 2,400 credits to spend on your gang. 2,000 credits if you're staying in the Interhive and 2,400 if you're going out into the Ash Waste. So that is double the starting points that you have to create your gang, which is absolutely fantastic. Now, unfortunately for a lot of people, they believe they get kind of a negative attitude when they look at that point value because what they think they need to do is double the number of miniatures that they need to have to successfully field a gang in the Aranthi Succession, but that's actually the wrong attitude to have about that. What you really should do is actually go for a quality versus a quantity build when it comes to your gang list. Instead of actually fielding 2,000 points worth of miniatures, maybe just field 1,000 points worth of miniatures like you normally would, but just fully equip them with everything they need to be successful by photo goggles, respirators, weapon accessories, vehicles with upgrades, everything that you will need to be successful in both the Ash Waste as well as the Underhive. And that's one of the cool things about the Aranthian Session because you can make some really powerful gangs right from the start. Now, while it is kind of cool to have that, there are some negative effects of actually playing in the Aranthian Session. First and foremost is going to be the Balanced Bad Wagon. Um, balanced Bad Wagon people are going to have a heyday with the Aranthian Succession rules, especially if their gang has not received any love from the Aranthian Succession as well. Um, for the last and stuff of the Aranthian Succession, for example, House Delac didn't get any new units or new fighters, for example, to add to their gang or vehicles for that matter. But they did get some uh, help with the vehicle crews as well as some ex expanded things they can purchase for their vehicles with the uh, Apocrypha Nicaragua rules. But for the most part, though, they don't have anything new with that. Now, I doubt that Delac players will complain because Delac player gangs are usually pretty powerful themselves. But let's talk about other groups. Things like Cults, for example, didn't get any support from the Aranthus Secession. Uh, Ash Waste Nomad players haven't gotten very much love either. But then again, you know, they're also playing very difficulty as well. So anybody who's going to be, you know, pitching a fit about not getting support, they're going to, you know, have a heyday with the fact that your gang has all this support from the Wrath of Secession, they don't. Another problem I also go run into as well is that the game, the narrative campaign is actually very narrative heavy with a lot of narrative based scenarios as well as narrative based builds. So if narrative war game is not exactly your forte, the Wrath of Secession could be something you might not want to engage in. So those are some aspects of the negatives of playing in the Wrath of Succession. Now let's talk about exactly how the Wrath of Secession setting impacts Vansar gangs. First of all, you can double the number of champions in any gang now. So instead of just normally going with normally num normal number of two champions, you can actually go up to four champions, which is kind of nice as well. And with the additional bump in the credit increase for your gang starting roster, Cyber Rachnids, if you always want to get those exotic beasts to help support your gang, that is now a viable option. Same thing with buying weapon accessories. Vansar gangs are actually quite heavy in adding weapon accessories such as uh, suspensors for heavy weapons, infra sights, uh, gun shrouds, all kinds of different things that they want to add to their weapons to make them a little bit more durable and better in the combat. Uh, things like hot shot last packs, focusing crystals. Before, when you start off a gang, you usually could not get those materials, but now you could also get that now. And so another thing that Vansar gangs have also kind of struggled with is that they're really points heavy. So their gangs have usually been really outnumbered, but never outgunned because the firepower makes the difference for them. So this kind of helps balance that a little bit more, where you can have more fighters starting off in your gang right from the start. 
Another thing that's really awesome is some of the supports you now receive as a Vansar player from the Ruins of Jardland expansion. First of all, you can now purchase what's known as Ash Waste Grav Cutters. You can get these for your Primes, your Augmix, as well as your Tex. It adds two inches to your movement allowance. Um, you don't get to be able to do the hit and run ability like you could do for your Neo Tex, but that's perfectly fine though because now you can get those for Primes, Augmix, and Tex, so that way they can fly around the battlefield with your Neo Tex at the same time. You also have access to a new vehicle crew. Those guys are called House Vansar Technicas. And they can actually drive vehicles now for your crews and actually do that. So that's really awesome. And at the same time, we also have a new brute called the Ashways Arachna Rig as well, which also comes with jump boosters. It's kind of like the same kind of guys from the uh, House Orlock Records. They're kind of like that, except imagine an Arachna Rig with one of those jump boosters. And you get an idea of what these guys can actually do. So they can cause a lot of destruction and a lot of problems for enemies as well. So now that we're done talking about exactly how House Van Sar gangs have been impacted by the Ranthus Session, let's go and talk about the alliances you can take for this gang. Now the nice thing for House Van Sar, because it is a nor or one of the starting house gangs, they do come with strong alliances, which is kind of nice. For the strong alliances, they have a strong alliance with the Promethean Guild, so if you want to make a, a Merchant Guild alliance, those are the guys you would go with. You also have the Imperial Posters, so if your game becomes an outlaw gang, they can make an alliance with the Imperial Posters. And they could also go with House Catalyst, which is a Noble House gang, so depending if you're a legal law-abiding gang or an outlaw gang, it doesn't matter. You can still make alliances with them. Now, in this list, the most useful gang of all are probably the Mopamethium Guild. It's going to be especially useful because for Vansar gangs that either use either one, a lot of plasma weapons, or two, use a lot of flamer weapons, having that alliance with the Promethean Guild is going to be really great because of the of Helmor's Radiance special rule. What that basically does, it removes the scarce trait from plasma weapons, so that way if you fail your ammo roll, you can just reroll it again and try to find more ammo later on instead of running out for the rest of the battle. And if you do have a flamer-based weapon, uh, it actually gains a plentiful trait, so it makes it really easy for you to reload that weapon as well. Not to mention, you also get access to the Pyromantic Conclave, which is not a, a slouch at all. It's really good support assault fire team that you could use. So that's a nice thing about that alliance as well. So that would be the number one alliance you should probably make. If you're going to be an outlaw gang, the... Um, Imperial Posters are actually quite good as well because they're outlaw mechanics. Plus, they're a very stealthy fighter who can also hold their own in close combat as well as uh, stealth missions. So that's actually a really nice little ability to balance that with that as well. And the, probably the least useful one of all is House Catalyst. I mean, House Catalyst does have some cool things with the Mass Killer as well as the Mind Flayed. But for the most part, though, this is more of a fluff choice more than anything else. Uh, of course, if you like that idea of having, like, killer gestures with carnival masks running around killing people for you by all means go ahead and do so i mean i understand the allure of a house catalyst alliance i mean those those miniatures sound really awesome and the game mechanics sound really cool as well now they're not as effective as let's say the promethean guild but it's probably more fun to do house catalyst so no matter which uh, alliance you take those are the options that you would go with and the reason why i recommend those is because of their strong alliance game mechanic which means that you get a little bit better chances of keeping your alliances over the long term with these groups now let's talk about Brutes, Hangers On, as well as Hired Guns. Now obviously the Rogue Dog is going to be the most important Hanger On to have for any gang right off the bat, just because in case your fighters get critically injured, or if you want to have a Medicaid ability on the tabletop to save your fighters, the Rogue Dogs are worth their weight in gold. At the same time, you also have a brand new brute now called the Ashways Arachna Rig, and you can actually have two Ashways Arachna Rids as well as a normal Arachna Rid from the Underhive, which means you could potentially have three Arachna Rids in your gang, supposedly enough, uh, suppose that you have enough credits to purchase these guys, which could be absolutely insane. The Ash Waste Arachna Rigs just take the normal Arachna Rig and make it even better. Uh, they're able to fly and jump and do all kinds of crazy stuff, getting plus one to hit and plus one strength on charges, all kinds of amazing things. So because of that, that could be really, really awesome as well if you want to use those in your gangs of Nicaragua as well. Now, the interesting thing about the... Um, uh, the Rackner rigs, though, for the Ash Waste, you can actually replace some of your weapons with flamers and harpoon launchers, which is actually kind of interesting. My only suggestion is why would you do that? Because why would you replace your plasma gun with a flamer? Unless, of course, you want to go with that. I mean, the rag gun I can understand replacing with a harpoon launcher, but, you know, it's really up to your choice when it comes to those uh, upgrades for your uh, Ash Waste Rackner rigs. 
All right, so let's go and talk about your starting roster that I recommend for your house fans are gang for the Ranthi Secession uh, with worth 2,400 credits. So first of all, you got to have a Prime, which could be the leader of your gang. It's going to cost you 245 credits. This guy's going to have an armored buddy glove as well as mesh armor, giving them a four-up armor save. Now, this guy's weapon package is actually quite basic. He's going to be armed with a plasma pistol as well as a high strong energy shield. And the reason why it's made for more close combat, but the real reason why is because you're only using these things to protect him, really, because the way he's going to be important is that you give this guy the overseer skill. That way he can pass a leadership test and have double sets activations for his Ogmex, which will be causing a lot more problems for your enemies. And that comes in the form of Ogmex number one. He's going to cost you 380 credits, and this fighter's got an armored body glove, mesh armor for that 4-up armor save. They also are packing a last cannon with a suspenser, so that way shooting this gun becomes a basic action. They're also equipped the last pistol for a backup weapon, as well as photo goggles, so that way they can shoot in the darkness. And you'd give this person the fixture skill. Now the reason why that is the case is because you're going to make an alliance with the Promethean Guild on this one, and one of the drawbacks is they have to pay D3 times 10 credits to the Promethean Guild at the end of every battle. So hopefully you'll be able to mitigate this cost by using the Ogmex Fixer skill in order to solve that. Plus, with a plus two ballistic skill, you really don't need much support for ballistic skills, so we're not going to worry about that. Now, Ogmex number two is going to cost you 335 credits. This guy is also going to have armored body glove as well as mesh armor for that four-up armor save, but they're going to be equipped with a flamer, and they're also going to have a last pistol for backup weapon. And the reason why this person's got a flamer is because they'll be flying around an ash waste grav cutter and they'll have the fast shot skill so they'll be able to fly around in the grav cutter shoot twice with their flamer causing all kinds of problems after that, you can have a third champion because we can have up to four champions with the Wrath of Succession rules, and that's going to be your Archaeotech. This person is going to cost you 245 credits. They're going to have armored body glove as well as mesh armor for that four up armor save, as well as a master crafted last sub carbine so that way they can reroll hits with their uh, rapid fire last sub carbine. You give them the spider rig to give them close combat abilities, as well as the alpha ocular cyber technica so that it automatically comes with it so that way they have basically infra sites that they could use with that last sub carbine. And you also give them the skill gadgeteer so that way you can add two rapid fire on your uh, last subcarbine as well. After that, you have two techs. Tech number one is going to cost you 290 credits. This person's got an armor body glove as well as mesh armor, and they're also packing a flamer as well. They have a last pistol, and they're also mounted on ash waste grav cutter, so that way they can fly around the battlefield, and they'll also be your gang specialist. Tech number two is going to cost you 120 credits. This person's gear is kind of basic. They have armored body glove as well as mesh armor for that four armor save, as well as a suppression laser, which is basically a laser-based shotgun. Then they could have two Neotechs. Neotech 1 and 2 both quit exactly the same at 160 credits. Both will have armored body gloves as well as mesh armor for that 4 up armor save. And both will be packing hand flamer so that way they get that strength 3 template weapon. They'll be zooming towards your enemies, setting guys on fire with those hand flamers. And then you'll have a Technica, which is your vehicle crew member. This guy's going to cost you 420 credits. They're equipped with photo goggles so that way they see what they're doing when they're driving. And they're driving a custom heavy vehicle that is tracked to deal with difficult terrain. That vehicle will have a transport bed so that way your fighters can mount on the back of it. They'll have all their steering to give you plus one in their handling, as well as nitro burners to make up that inch you lost when you convert it to a track vehicle. And it'll also have a mining laser for taking out enemy vehicles, as well as high value targets. And then lastly, of course, you'll have a rogue dock. It's going to cost you 50 credits. That person's got a last pistol, Medicaid Kit, as well as the Medicaid skill. Now, like I mentioned earlier, you will have a guild alliance on this gang, which will be the Prometheum Guild, and the reason why is because of the benefits it brings. One, you have a strong alliance, so that way your alliance will withstand any tests that you have to take against it, and you want really the Helm Wars Radiant Special Rule, which means that any plasma or flame weapons lose their scarcity trait, and if it doesn't have a scarcity trait like flame weapons, it'll gain the plentiful trait instead, and considering the number of flaming attacks, as well as plasma attacks this gang will have, kind of important to have that as well. Now, to mention, you'll have access the Pyromantic Conclave, which will act as its own little assault fire team, but we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail when we get to the tabletop tactics. Now, for drawbacks, you do have to worry about guard duty, which means you have to roll a d6 at the beginning of each battle, and on a roll of one or three, you have to either choose looters, smash and grab, caravan heist, or escort mission, and you must play as the defender. At the same time, you also have the power tap drawback, which means at the end of each battle, you must pay D3 times 10 credits to the guild. Now, that being said, of course, um, if you already have that fixer skill with your Ogmec, if they're able to match that price, then, of course, you could just pay that in lieu of actually losing any money, which would be kind of nice for your gang. Now, your Pyromantic Conclave will consist of four fighters. You have a Pyrocane Lord who's got a Refactor Field for that five-up ward save, a Shock Stave and Last Pistol for close combat. They also have Photon Flash Grenades, which are great because they take away enemy activations. They have the Evade Skill as well as the Overseer Ability, which is really powerful because what you want to do is spam that Overseer Ability on the Pyromajor, which is the Conclave's champion. This fighter also has a Refractor Field with five-up armor save, ward save. They also have a Flamer as well as a Stub Gun and Photon Flash Grenades. They also have a Cult Icon for larger group activations as well 
well as nerves of steel so that way they can escape pinning if they pass a cool test. You want to put Arbiter on your pyro meters so that way they can fire that flamer twice per turn, which is great. And they have two cinders. Both of them will be equipped with last pistols as well as axes, which is great. But with the real reason why you like these guys is because they have the photon flash grenades. They'll be lobbing those as much as they can as possible to take away enemy activations. And you'll also give them the spring up skill as well, so that way they can also get up for if they get shot at as well. And that pretty much makes up your starting roster for this one. So with your starting roster over with, let's go and talk about how you're going to use these guys on the tabletop. All right, so for this game, you're going to actually have four different fire teams. You have a support fire team as well as three assault fire teams. Your support fire team will consist of your prime, Ogmec number one, that's the guy who's armed with the last cannon, as well as your Technica who's driving your custom heavy vehicle. Assault fire under team number two, one, I call the bodyguard fire team. This is going to consist of your Archaeotech as well as tech number two, that's the guy who's armed with the suppression laser. Assault fire team number two is going to be what I like to call the air cavalry fire team. That's going to consist of your Ogmec number two, that's the guy who's got the flamer and running a grav cutter. Your tech number one which is your specialist who's got a flamer and also riding a grav cutter and your two neotechs who are also equipping hand flamers and mounted on grav cutters after that you'll have assault fire team number three which will consist of your pyromantic conclave which is your power cane lord your power major as well as your two cinders now all the fighters not mounted on grav cutters will be mounted upon the custom heavy vehicle the technica will close the distance towards the enemy and when within range the support fire team will launch long range attacks with the last cannon as well as the mining laser now the prime spams the overseer skill on augment number one so that way they allow shooting twice with that last cannon and the fire team will primarily focus on enemy vehicles as well as high valley targets which means about every turn you should be getting three shots off two with the last cannon and one with the mining laser really really powerful shooting now assault fire team number one plays the role of bodyguards the archaeotech and tech number two primarily focuses on protecting the support fire team for enemy attacks if need be the assault fire team can of course conduct their own assault against enemy targets of opportunity or objectives, it just kind of depends on the situation they might find themselves in. Now, Assault Fire Team Number 2 acts as your air cavalry. They'll be swooping across the battlefield on their grav cutters, flanking the enemy. They should engage the enemy on the assault, opening with their flamer weapons. Augment Number 2 can shoot twice, while the tech and the neotechs only fire once, which means that you'll have five focusing fire template shots upon the enemy, who will scatter the enemy once they catch on fire and also blaze as well. At the same time, you also have Assault Fire Team Number 3, which is the Pyromantic Conclave. They'll dismount from the custom heavy vehicle when in range and advance upon the enemy. Ideally, they should form a pincer attack, coordinating with your assault fire team number two to catch the enemies in a cost fire of flaming attacks. And when this happens, the pyrocane lord will overspam their overseer ability on the pyro major to fire twice with their flamer. And then the real killers will be the cinders, who will then lob their photon flash grenades towards the enemy, taking away their ability to activate and setting everybody on fire. And that's pretty much how you would play this gang on the tabletop. Now, as the campaign develops, of course, recruit some more subtext, right? And the reason why you want to do that is because even though the subtext are juvie level fighters, they are still have ballista skill four. And if you give them last guns with hot shot last packs, they'll have reliable, reliable strength force shooting that you engage your enemies at medium to long ranges as well. I also suggest purchasing photo goggles for the fighters so that way they could also see in the dark too as the campaign develops. And with additional funds, try recruiting some arachnorids for heavy shooting as well as assault, assault support. Uh, that could be really cool having two of those things running around, jumping around and setting people on fire, shooting people with harpoon launchers, or blasting enemies with plasma guns and, you know, twin linked less, uh, last subcarbines as well. It could also be fun doing that too. Now, at the same time, you could also probably recruit some cyber arachnids that could also be helpful in providing security for your leaders as well as your champions. It gives your leader and champions of fearsome skills so that way your opponents have to pass willpower test to charge at you plus they could also shoot with their web uh, web projectors so it could be all kinds of chaos and all kinds of fun as well so there you guys have it. In conclusion, upgrading your gang to an Aranthian Secession campaign is a great way to fully equip your gang with powerful weapons, war gear, as well as vehicles. With new vehicles droppings and new rules dropping, this could be a really fun way to equip the gang of your dreams and also make it really awesome as well. And of course, if you are stressed about doubling the number of miniatures you need a gang, do not worry about that. Instead of doubling the size of your gang, rather just stick with the gang that you have and just go for a quality of the build of your gang rather than the quantity as well. And as always, I will be dropping new videos on this topic to help you guys in your necromunda journey so that's good for you guys as always please feel free to like comment and or subscribe your guys input is valuable to us as always also check us on facebook instagram as well as blog.com for all nice greatest hobby news related to this channel that's good for this one you guys i will catch you guys next one peace out and stay classy